Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, August 22nd, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, Libertarian presidential candidate Gary Johnson backs a fee on carbon. Then, some suggest there may be a new leaker at the NSA. After that, a former sailor who snapped pictures of a submarine seeks mercy by citing the Clinton defense. He ends up getting a year in prison. And the next time you do something that jeopardizes national security, tell the judge that Colin Powell said it was okay. That's next. Looking at something like this, I've seen this before, many briefings, but it says, who is a threat? Insiders, Hassan, Manning, Snowden, Alexis, uh, and it also lists David Petraeus and Hillary Clinton on the slide. Now, we do know that Hillary Clinton is a threat to America. She has lied under oath. Uh, we know what's happened with Benghazi. First, the Obama administration said it wasn't ransom for hostages, the $400 million that they secretly transferred in foreign currencies to the Iranians for the release of the hostages. Then they admitted last week that it was. Today, the State Department admits what we all knew would happen with this bad policy, that the Iranian government is now actively seeking to capture more Americans because that's how they get paid if you're a terrorist state. The State Department has warned that Iran is seeking to capture U.S. citizens. This is from the Washington Free Beacon. They say the State Department today issued a warning urging U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to Iran, which has made the detention of Americans a priority. The latest travel advisory, which emphasizes Iran's desire to capture U.S. citizens, comes on the heels of a growing scandal, they report, of the Obama administration's decision to pay Iran $400 million in cash on the same day that it happened to free several U.S. hostages. Of course, they admitted last week that that was in exchange for the hostages. Now, as we pointed out before, the whole idea that this is ransom is bad policy. They didn't talk, however, to the Department of Justice and ask their opinion on this because they wanted their policy opinions. They talked to the Department of Justice because it is, quite frankly, obviously illegal. It violates the sanctions. It violates the uh, executive orders that Obama himself had put out just a few weeks earlier, stating that Iran remained a terrorist state. They violated the law. So what remains now is for the Obama administration to come out and say, yeah, we broke the law, like Hillary Clinton, and no prosecutor in their right mind would come after us, okay? But understand, this is the M.O., the method of operation of drug dealers. And we've had a U.S. Senate candidate, uh, Republican Kirk in Illinois, point that out. And of course, the mainstream media was very upset that he pointed out that Obama is acting like a drug dealer. This is precisely the way drug dealers operated under Bill Clinton and under the Bush and Reagan administrations as well, flying in cash with airplanes secretly uh, for whatever it was that they wanted. But we have a story at Infowars.com uh, from Adon Salazar that I think illustrates one of the three legs of danger, the globalism versus nationalism. But of course, this is the imminent danger that we're seeing here. Now, just as we've seen in Europe, we've seen uh, terrorist attacks become a common occurrence in Germany and in France. Will we see drug cartel murders and mutilations become a common occurrence here in America? Decapitated, dismembered body is found in the San Antonio dumpster. This is an InfoWars uh, story from Adon Salazar. He points out this is cartel-like violence hitting home here in America. Residents in San Antonio are on edge after a human body was found over the weekend, dismembered, decapitated, and burnt beyond recognition. It was discovered inside an apartment complex dumpster early yesterday morning on the southeast side of San Antonio. An apartment resident said it looked like a burning pile. He was one of the first people to investigate what he believed was simply burning furniture. That's when he located what he said looked like a badly burned woman's body. He said, I could tell that it was a lady with her hands cut off and her head cut off and her feet cut off. It's like someone just threw her there and lit her on fire. And we have seen this happening over and over again in Mexico. Understand, when we look at the drug war that is going in Mexico, and of course, we have a very important part to play in that drug war. Understand, however, that that violence that is happening in Mexico between these drug cartels has already claimed tens of thousands of lives. There's a higher casualty rate there than in the war in Iraq. So we have to understand that this is something that is coming to our country 
if we are unwilling to look at uh, border security. And he points out in the article, uh, Don Salazar says, while police are not speculating on a possible motive, violence such as beheadings and dismemberment are consistent with the Mexican and transnational cartel activity, and it is also prevalent in the San Antonio area. But now the open borders and the violence that comes with them is just one of the three legs that the globalists are using to fight for a global government. The other one, as we're reminded by this story from the New York Times, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the so-called free trade deals. The New York Times says Obama readies one last push for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, what is interesting about this story is not the fact that Obama is still pushing for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this globalist trade deal that was written in secret by corporate lobbyists that our elected representatives were not even allowed to see that is going to be rammed through with the unconstitutional process put in place by the Trade Promotion Authority that most of our, our senators and representatives, Democrat and Republican, voted to put through. But the interesting thing, I think, is the narrative that's being sold to us by both the Democrat New York Times and the Republican congressman who is head of the House Ways and Means Committee, that this, that there is a bipartisan opposition to it by both Hillary and Donald Trump. That simply isn't true. Listen to what they have to say. They say his successor, Obama's successor, whether Democrat or Republican, opposes it. That is the big lie. Hillary Clinton does not oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We have pointed this out over and over again. They say, as does most of his party, okay? They have, uh, at the uh, Democrat convention, they said they had signs with TPP and a slash through it. Those were Bernie Sanders supporters, not Hillary Clinton supporters. Those are people who understood that she was selling them out on this vital issue of trade. And then we have a Republican congressman, Kevin Brady, who is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, says, we can't grow America's economy unless we are not merely buying American, but selling American all over the world. Look, it is not free trade, okay? It is not free trade if somebody is managing your economy abroad. People that are not accountable to you are going to control your economy. And then, of course, the third leg of this, it's open borders. It's the controlling of our economy by the globalists who wrote these secret trade deals. And then it is the climate change treaty. And we're reminded of that by Gary Johnson backing now carbon credits, okay, carbon taxes. And they call him in the Daily Caller, they call him the Libertarian Party presidential nominee. Let's just call him the LP nominee. There's absolutely nothing libertarian about Gary Johnson or William Weld. These are people who are in direct opposition to the Second Amendment. They support an assault weapon ban. We have seen them now jump into crony capitalism in every flavor. Here's another example. They say he's no skeptic of man-made global warming, and he has endorsed a fee, a fee on carbon dioxide emissions. It's all part of his free market approach to global warming, says Gary Johnson. Now, understand that when he comes in and says that this is a fee and not a tax, do you remember the last time we heard that? It was when Mitt Romney was defending his raising taxes as governor of, Men of um, Massachusetts, saying they were fees and not taxes, okay? But, of course, Mitt Romney is exactly the kind of guy that Gary Johnson and William Weld want. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting that they would openly court and beg Mitt Romney to endorse them, even promising him a cabinet position. Remember before the Republican convention, we were told that Donald Trump could not name the people or a list of uh, probable people that he would have as cabinet members because that would violate law. Well, listen to what uh, Gary Johnson and uh, William Well did. They said if Mitt Romney wants to be part of the administration, that would be a guarantee. Okay, they said, and of course, this is Weld. He says, I personally think he would be great as Secretary of Defense, even as Secretary of State. And he said, hey, Mitt, we want you to endorse us. <laughs> and by the way, how would you like to be Secretary of State? That is the kind of blatant whoring that we are now seeing from this third party candidate who is really nothing but a stalking horse for Hillary Clinton. Meanwhile, 15,000 new emails have come up from Hillary Clinton, and these are not the 30,000 emails I had before, or the 30,000 emails that she and her lawyers destroyed before they turned over the information to the FBI. This is an additional 30,000. At the same time, we just had on Friday a judge ordering that Clinton would not have to testify under oath in an email deposition suit.
U.S. District Court Judge Emmett Sullivan said the conservative group Judicial Watch had not demonstrated that they required an in-person deposition of Hillary Clinton. This is key, because if you remember, Bill Clinton was not impeached because he had affairs. He was not impeached because he raped women. He was impeached because he committed perjury under oath. As a lawyer, and of course Hillary Clinton is also a lawyer, they understand the implications of perjury. That's why they want to avoid a deposition under oath. Nevertheless, interestingly enough, the New York Post points out that Clinton aides are very upset that there might be some leaks of her testimony to the FBI. Why? They don't take national security seriously, but they do take her being exposed in a lie. Meanwhile, we see that as the FBI director said, you're not going to be able to get away with this on your own. A sailor has been sentenced to one year in jail and a confiscation of his gun rights. But of course, Hillary is going to get four years in the White House and take your guns. Stay with us right after the break. We're going to be talking to Gary Haven about his film, Amerageddon. Manufactured fears about Islamophobia have been weaponized to characterize all criticism of Islam as racist. But Islam is not a race. No belief system is above scrutiny, especially one as intolerant and barbarous as Islam. Back in December, I made a video called Islam is not a religion of peace. And this was the response. If you say one more time that Islam is not a religion of peace, I'm going to come to your house and kill you. If I found you face to face, do you want to know what I would personally do? I would actually, actually fucking kill you and then put the ISIS flag over your body and declare victory in the name of ISIS. I used to be one of your loyal fans on YouTube, though I find what you say about Islam to be insulting. Thus I will lay claim to your lands and within time you will be enslaved. Jihad will never accept the Western values of your imperialism. We shall cleanse your lands with fire and steel. Your waters shall flow with blood and your women shall serve us. I'm a proud British Muslim white male, and you know what? I find what you say about Islam offensive, and soon those words will be your last. We Muslims do not forgive easily. We will soon take over your lands, and your women belong to us all. Your white man will have only one choice, join or die. Soon you will pay for your hatred towards Islam. Your hateful nature will be met with Allah's wrath. How dare you say that Islam is not a religion of peace? I will come on your house and kill you! Yeah. Little word of advice for you fellas. You're not going to prove that Islam is a religion of peace by threatening to kill me. That kind of proves my point. What also proves my point is an entire summer of terror attacks by Islamists who in every case chant Allah Akbar and cite the Quran as the inspiration behind their rampage. The Syrian refugee suicide bomber in Germany said that his attack was a revenge act against Germans standing in the way of Islam. I guess that's nothing to do with Islam. The axe attacker on a train in Germany published a post 24 hours before his rampage saying it was an act of retribution against, quote, enemies of Islam. I guess that's nothing to do with Islam. He also said he wanted to take revenge on the infidels. I guess that's Nothing to do with Islam. ISIS gunmen in Bangladesh killed those who couldn't recite the Quran. I guess that's nothing to do with Islam. We've also had another summer of mass sexual assaults committed by Muslim migrants across Europe. Which of course is nothing to do with Islam. Anyone who claims otherwise is Islamophobic. <laughs> In fact, Islam is so blameless that we now have jihadists screaming Allah Akbar while stabbing Jews and within hours, it's dismissed as just someone with a mental illness. After the Nice massacre, the BBC was more concerned about, quote, anti-Islamic tweets than a guy mowing down hundreds of people with a truck in the name of Islam. So each of these red dots is an anti-Islamic tweet coming from the UK. And that that we can see happening right now, that's a digital reaction to the Nice attacks. Do you notice how they've redefined Islamophobia as anything that's, quote, anti-Islamic? Because criticizing a violent and intolerant belief system is now an act of intolerance. It's Islamophobic. They're trying to characterize genuine and warranted concern over Islamofascism as some kind of hate crime wave sweeping Europe. Because the real victims of Islamist terror are Muslims who might get mean stares on public transport. Baby secret, she whispers just to you. Allahu Akbar. I mean, the West is so rampantly Islamophobic that Westerners view Muslims more positively than Muslims view Westerners. Okay, so if the West is so riddled with Islamophobia, 
Why do hundreds of millions of Muslims all want to move here? I don't remember Jews being that keen on visiting Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Oh, and criticizing Sharia law is also now Islamophobic, according to the BBC. The tax are going to change people's opinions. So if you've got something to say, then you can say it. Do you want to talk about Sharia law? You want to talk about Sharia law to me? We can talk about, we'll talk about Sharia law. You obviously said it for a reason. CNN Sally Cohn says that Sharia law is progressive. Characteristics of Sharia law. Wife beating, forced child marriage, and the complete disenfranchisement and subjugation of women in marriage, property ownership, and divorce. Yep, sounds really progressive, doesn't it? The Washington Post reported that, quote, Islam can be fairly described as feminist. In fact, Islam is so feminist that in Muslim countries like Pakistan, 1,000 women die every single year as a result of honor killings. Honor killings are permissible under Sharia law, and Sharia law is progressive. Allahu Akbar! This is an exercise in Islamophilia. They're now asserting that anyone who doesn't fully submit to and embrace all facets of Islam is an Islamophobe. They're creating media hoaxes to advance the narrative that Islamophobia is rampant. A beach brawl in Corsica, France, blamed on locals harassing Muslim women wearing burkinis actually turned out to be Muslim men throwing stones at anyone who tried to get on the beach. The shooting of an imam in New York blamed on Trump supporting Islamophobes actually turned out to be the result of a feud between Muslims and Hispanics. Oh yeah, and global warming is also caused by Islamophobia. After Brexit, the BBC claimed that Britain was experiencing a tidal wave of hatred. In reality, reports of hate crimes moderately increased, not actual documented cases of hate crimes. Welcome back. Joining me now is Gary Haven. I want to talk, Gary, about Amerageddon. Of course, that's the, the movie that you put together with Mike Norris, uh, son of Chuck Norris. Um, I had a little bit to do with that. Uh, shot right here <laughs> in the studio. Now it's on DVD. We've got a special that's going on, two of those, uh, as well as get a free bottle of colloidal silver. It's a great deal. But tell us a little bit about Amerageddon. You know, we've, we've looked even over this last weekend. We've now got the German government telling their citizens, you need to be prepared for an emergency. What do they know? that uh, the American public doesn't know or that many people are still not aware of that they need to prepare. You know, I read that. In fact, I read it on InfoWars yesterday. Uh, the German government is telling their people to store two weeks of food and five days of water. And it's a good question. What is it that, that they know? And by the way, David, I want to thank you uh, for your contribution to the movie. Uh, oh, David was... provides the opening scene and, uh, and sets it up uh, uh, in just a beautiful, professional way, as we all know and watch him do every day on InfoWars. Well, thank you for letting me be a part of it. It really was interesting. To uh, you really uh, enhanced the quality in a, in a, in a wonderful well, way. Uh, Amir Giddens is a movie uh, uh, that depicts an event. Uh, I like to say that it, it it's uh, a true story that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, we're at risk every day in America uh, from an electromagnetic pulse attack. Uh, in, in fact, North Korea flies a satellite twice a day over the center of the United States at just the optimum altitude to detonate a nuclear device that would create an electromagnetic pulse uh, that would decimate uh, all electronics in our country. Uh, first among them is the electric grid. Imagine having no electricity, having no internet, having no banking. Imagine not having any fuel, not having any water. And if this were to happen, uh, these transformers that would have to be replaced, most of them come from China. They have an 18-month lead time. Uh, bottom line, folks, is that we're going to be uh, uh, out of food, out of fuel, uh, out of medicine. Uh, there'll be no currency. And, and it's so important an issue that the Congress of the United States, on two different occasions, did a study, uh, the EMP study, and Congress determined that 90% of Americans would be dead within, uh, within the 12 months. And, and they've demanded that, that somebody do something about it. Of course, Obama's not interested in that. So the movie, uh, uh, my character sees it coming, goes before Congress, and I argue with an evil senator uh, who was played by our very own Alex Jones. 
Uh, I told Alex, by the way, uh, you need to tone down to evil just a little bit over the top. He's, he's had a lot of experience watching evil senators. So he, he's trained for this for a very long time. Well, I'll tell you, he was a natural. <laughs> yeah, he uh, was. Uh, it, we sure enjoyed having him in the movie as well. Uh, but my character sees it coming and prepares. And so the movie not only shows you how to prepare for an event like this, uh, and, it, and it gives you an opportunity to bring your friends and family, the, the people who think that you're, you know, maybe uh, a, a French fry short of a Happy Meal, uh, <laughs> to show them that the world really is uh, uh, different than, than they've been lulled into thinking. Uh, and so the movie is important. It, it's a movie about a message, and we have created a movement around this movie. It's called Amerigeddon. Uh, it's showing in some theaters still around the country, but it's available on DVD exclusively right here uh, at Alex Jones. Uh, and and when you when you go on the website to the uh, uh, to the Infowars store, uh, you can find that there's a special offer. Uh, we want you to buy two of the movies because you want to keep one and be able to give one and share it uh, with other people. Uh, but when you buy two you get a $20 bottle of colloidal silver. And so this is a, a, an extremely good offer. And yeah. by the way, as a nutritionist, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, that's a great product. And um, uh, in, in, in times something like you should this, have to prepare. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it's good even for external cuts. I've used it, you know, because yeah. silver is a disinfectant. It's a very, very natural, clean disinfectant. So. Yeah, so I'm really proud that you've uh, uh, made the offer so generous that people could uh, get a premium product like this with the purchase of two uh, uh, movies, uh, Amerigeddon, on your website. We're really proud that you are the exclusive uh, distributor of it. And it was our way of giving back to you. Uh, because when people buy this product, they help your program. Yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, you were so much of a help to helping us make the movie get the truth out. Everything from your role in the entry of it to Alex Jones. So thank you guys well, thank you. for the support. It's very important that people understand this. As you're talking about the fact getting two of these so you can share this with other people, understand that this is a very real scenario. And it's a scenario, the one that you picked. I mean, there's many scenarios that could take down the power grid. And of course, the Germans are just telling their people 10 mm -hmm. days supply. But there's a lot of things that could happen, as you pointed out, in this particular scenario. It would be a very long uh, power down uh, uh, situation. There's so many things that could take this down, but this is something that we could do something about if people had the will to do that. If we had people in Congress that were concerned about the American people rather than feathering their nest uh, for the people that they work for. You know, Dr. Peter Pry, who is the director of Homeland Security for, for EMP, uh, and I've had uh, several discussions, and you know, I was really pushing for a national act, something like the GRID Act, and he said, you know, Gary, the, the, they're not going to do it on a national basis, but they may do it on a statewide basis. And David and I, you know, we live here in Texas, and I'm happy to say uh, that Texas is actually doing something. And it's interesting because there's three grids in, in the country. Uh, Texas is the only uh, state to have its own grid. And our legislature here uh, has, has begun to take serious action to protect the grid in Texas. So we're getting something mm -hmm. done now. And I'm glad to live in a place that uh, uh, that really is responsive to the people. Uh, those of you that don't live in Texas, either come on down uh, as fast as you can, uh, or or start demanding that that your leadership in your states do their job, uh, uh, which is to protect you from threats. And that's and, a key thing. I think we need to understand that there's a lot that can be done at the local level. We've gotten to the point in this country where we think every problem needs to be and can only be solved in Washington. And yet there's a lot of things that can be done at the state level. And ultimately, your survival comes down to your own preparation. Yep. Bottom line. I mean, you can't collective. There's things collectively that it's important to try to do. But bottom line, you need to look out for yourself and for your family and to set aside things that you think you need and you need more than 10 days. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a big uh, planner and a in a and, and uh, prepper, uh, I, I have water sources on my ranch from from rain and gutter systems. Uh, uh, I have food to feed my family, even my community uh, for for months. Uh, you know, and feeding ten thousand children a day. You know, I'm I'm in a food mm -hmm. ministry. It's it's something I've been doing for years now. Uh, and you know, you need to have the means to protect it. And and uh, I, you know, I'm armed all the time, and I make sure people around me are. Uh, because one day you may may need to protect yourself. 
But of course, that's another reason why you need to have people within your community that you know, yeah. because you're not going to be able to stand there as a one man army and protect yeah. yourself as, as something that you do as a community. It's one of the things that we've had a lot of preppers uh, talk mm-hmm. about creating a community of people who have certain skills and can come together in a time. And that's yeah. one of the things you see in Amerigeddon. Yeah. And I tell you, the time is, uh, is, is not uh, after it happens. The time is now mm-hmm. uh, uh, or it's going to be too late. And, and, you know, David, the most important thing uh, uh the most important prep you can do is make sure that your spiritual uh, yes. uh, person is in order. You know, as a Christian, uh, without Jesus, you don't really have anything. Nothing else matters. Uh, and, and so you need to make sure that you're right with God and the people around you are. And, and I think the time is winding down uh, uh, where, where uh, it's going to become very difficult uh, in this mm-hmm. country. And so uh, I would encourage those of faith to, to, uh, to, to begin to share it with other people. Uh, uh, ultimately, that's how this thing's going to going to be resolved. Absolutely, yeah. We're, once we have the uh, uh, a change of heart of people, once they turn, God turns the fathers' hearts back to their children. That's when they're going to look forward to a, a country that they can that they can take control of, that they can reform, building something for the future. That is always the hallmark of a restoration, isn't it? Yes, turning, the, turning the hearts back to the families. Thank you so much, Gary. And again, that special is uh, two copies of Amerigeddon. And we're also throwing in a $20 value, a bottle of colloidal silver. Get that movie. It's one very important scenario that could happen, but there are others that could happen. But it'll start a conversation. Maybe it'll be the basis for you pulling together people in your community that can come together in times of need, whether it is a man-made catastrophe or a natural catastrophe or something that is done by the government. Who knows? But that's a way to start with people. Start a dialogue. Uh, take a look at this movie. It's a great conversation. Start in a great movie. Great movie. Glad you did that. Thank you so much. Gary Haven, and the special is Amerigeddon. We'll be right back. Joining me now is Steve Quayle. Of course, you can find him at stevequayle.com. That is Q-U-A-Y-L-E.com. And Steve, you know, we want to talk about World War III. As we mentioned uh, here as we're talking to each other before the break, uh, it, one of my favorite movies has been Blast from the Past. And I think we're kind of at the point in real life that they ended up that film where you've got the guy pacing off his underground bunker again. But uh, what do you see happening in terms of the revival of tensions? Uh, the Cold War has certainly been started up successfully in Ukraine. Uh, we've got issues happening in the South China Sea, territorial issues where uh, China is coming in and trying to establish uh, domination in that part being challenged by the U.S. military. Talk about uh, what you see happening in light of the new Cold War. Will it turn into a new hot war? Well, I think we are already seeing the opening salvos of a hot war. You know, one of the headlines and one of the articles that was really uh, putting forth the idea that the billionaires are headed to their bunkers. Yeah. And I think it was in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah, In New Zealand, other places, every place around the world. Big money has access to big info brokers, information brokers, the intelligence agency slash business relationship, i.e. Google, Microsoft, any of the tech uh, companies, very, very close. So private intelligence has become a big deal in the back rooms of uh, uh, big money. I see that we are seeing, if you will, the orchestrated buildup of tensions to the point where at something has to give. We only hear of the real news coming from the Ukraine when we get people that are posting on the front lines or the Russians warning. What I've learned about the Russians, and and let me share this, I think, and again, Alex and I have both made the statement, we're not Russophiles, but mm-hmm. it, it's astonishing to me that there are actual people who represent the United States in Congress and Senate who take nuclear war as kind of a casual well, you know, we'll just go bomb yeah. this or bomb that. Yeah, and it's reflected in the American population as well. They're very casual about it, unlike the Russians. But, of course, the Russians have a memory of massive destruction going back to World War II. We didn't see that here in America, the people who survived. Well, well, the current entity in the White House has been destroying the military for the last eight years of his reign. Uh, the Russians have been building up. By the way, Russians have some very sophisticated weapons. I remember years ago when I started on talk radio, David, the Vladimir Zironovsky, you know, they used to call him Mad Vlad. He talked about a weapon system called the Elipton, E-L-I-P-T-O-N. And, you know, they're not idle boasts. And I've seen some really, I would say, provocative 
uh, moves to almost get them to strike first. You know, yeah. look, we're surrounding Russia, and, and, and that's called encirclement. And look, I mean, when I say, look, people, please open your eyes, you know. Every, maybe you guys should have a new InfoWars binocular special so people can see beyond their nose. And I'm not kidding, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that, and Alex and I talked about this, the virtual world has robbed people's ability to relate to the real world. The difference in the uh, ability to protect your population determines your nuclear policy. Mm -hmm. Russia, another headline just on Drudge a couple days ago, Putin building more bunkers, you know? And the Russian missile systems, or S-500, the, the ability to field more submarines, the ability to update and upgrade, and the ability of the strength of will. See, here's what you've got. You've got somebody who knows what he, he can do, telling the rest of the world, you better realize what we can, we can do. You see the destruction of the American military, and I have a different reason for that. I believe that because of the war against God in this country, you know, it's God's the one that gave us victories. I mean, half the Marine air, uh, airplanes can't fly. Air Force is going down to the salvage yard in Arizona to pick parts, you know. But at we the had air superiority for such a long period of time, and yet... Where is the point of attack, really, in the military by the Satanists? Okay, it's been at the Air Force Academy. Yes, <laughs> it's where they come in. And, oh man, and, you know uh, what, David? Try to overturn uh, the expression of religion and then establish, uh, the, you know, the celebration of these pagan rituals there at the Air Force Academy. I'm glad you bring that up because the the idea is is that they actually think, and this is something that people lose track of in the the Illuminati elite Luciferian world. They actually believe that they have the weapon systems to take on God. Now, my mm -hmm. simple question to that is, who do you think made the raw materials and created them simply by speaking them into existence? You won't really believe what you make with those can yeah. take, and, and, but that's how blind they are. I believe that this is the ultimate, if you will, uh, trap to bring as many people into the destructive forces and field of nuclear weaponry. And again, most people don't know the difference between a fission bomb, a fusion bomb, uh, neutron weapons. And the laser weapons, I've actually had people in the state of Texas who are high up in uh, military intelligence and actual special operations tell me they got stuff now that makes atom bombs look like peace shooters. Mm -hmm. When you hear that from a four-star general, he didn't tell me what it was, but he told me that they have them. And the Russians have the same thing. And so what now we're seeing is we're seeing coordinated warfare. We're seeing weather warfares. We're seeing, excuse me, warfares in multiple dimensions, different areas of warfare and warfares. That means multiple countries uh, using their high-tech weather weapons against each other. Well, one of the concerns I have is what happens with the, the reverberation effect of everybody bouncing uh, radio waves or scalar waves or whatever off the ionosphere and everything's heating up. I maintain that the state of Texas has been under weather warfare attack for years, and I, I can pretty much back it up. I wrote a book called Weather Wars and Unnatural Disasters. And still, people don't get it that when you got Secretary of Defense Cohen, you get Zygmunt Brzezinski talking about that one nation can make war on another nation, and then you understand that into a nuclear theater now, we don't even know what the Russians truly have, because under the guise of, you know, the Soviet Union is gone, the former Soviet Union is gone, but we have, how do I say this, children shouldn't play with nuclear weapons. Yeah. We have yeah. this, if you will, this liberal stupidicus. Oh, here's a new one. Okay. <laughs> a new Latin. This isn't Latin, but liberalis, <laughs> liberalis stupidicus, dumicus unto deathicus. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes. So I'm not trying to make fun of this, but here's yeah. the deal. In the background, they're showing right now, they're showing the, the mushroom clouds. They're showing the devastation of cities. Neutron weapons can kill all the people without having a shock wave, blast wave, and the thermal effect, because our bodies just aren't designed to take intense neutron bombardment. I actually, David, interviewed Sam Cohen, the inventor of the neutron bomb. Mm -hmm. He told me on talk radio for three or four different multi-hour shows that we, 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 the United States government, gave to the Chinese the neutron weapons. So it's not just the atomic bomb, you know, and the blast from the past. I'll tell you what. In my opinion, everybody should start stepping up those uh, uh, those preparations, preparations, yeah. and uh, and and picking them up too. And and this is critical: the shutdown of all important article staples. It doesn't matter if it's food, water, clothing, survival supplies. That's going to come. 
too many truckers are idle, uh, too many uh, train engines or whatever locomotives are sidetracked, and the compression of the middle class, middle class just doesn't have the money anymore they used to. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the candidate for the president, uh, Hillary Clinton, talking about she's going to tax the middle class more, good night. That's like, uh, uh, that's like a vampire saying to the, the corpse or to his other vampire, run that corpse through the uh, ringer so we can get the last ounce of blood or the last milliliter of blood. It is so late in the game that I believe this, that it is no longer just, you know, somebody say, well, we went through the Cuban Missile Crisis. You don't know what went on behind the Cuban Missile Crisis. What we're going through now is real. I don't believe it's just, uh, you know, oh, maybe we will, maybe we won't. I think the, the stupid indifference and the denial of the real threat that uh, nuclear, and I, I see this, I see Russia and China coming against us. And I think now is a time for people to prepare because we're looking at massive economic disruption when we look at uh, automated cars coming in, robotics coming in and taking people's jobs. We're looking at massive unemployment that will be both horizontal and vertical in the economy. It's gonna affect all different segments of the economy and it's gonna affect it at every different level. We're going to have massive unemployment. We're looking at uh, automated uh, uh, trucks that are going to be driving and so forth. So now is the time really to prepare. But I think it's absolutely amazing when we look at the difference in attitude, the American people, as you point out, as we began this, versus Russia. They lived, the civilian population there lived through World War II. They saw that kind of massive destruction. People here just can't believe that that's going to happen. Well, in denial of reality is the, I would say this, if there is a medical condition, I believe we've been programmed real quick. We are the most psychologically programmed uh, population of any nation in the world for defeat. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve Quayle. SteveQuayle.com. We'll be right back. Well, a terrible week for Hillary Clinton. This just in, the FBI has announced that 14,900 emails, new emails they've uncovered on her server, uh, conservative watchdog group, Judicial Watch, they've successfully sued. They're going to be released coming October. Leanne, this is a big deal unearthing in this probe on her server an additional 15,000 emails. Right. This is a rough week for her. Which, of course, let's not forget, she swore under oath <laughs> that she turned over everything to the State Department. And so now they're saying that this is actually more uh, than nearly 50 percent more than the 38,000 plus that her her lawyers deemed unnecessary to turn over because these were personal emails. Right. Well, we know that Bill Clinton, he tried to cut a deal with Lynch on that private plane to make sure that she was never prosecuted, never indicted for anything. And we know that she has a severe a uh, dishonesty problem, a pattern of being, you know, incapable of telling the <laughs> truth. And we're talking about a massive cachet. This is coming out, this announcement, four weeks ahead of the election is when we can expect this. This could be a game changer for her, depending on what they find. And they're already, the DNC, I know you've got some information over this, they're already backpedaling, saying, you know what, it might not actually yeah. be real. We don't. They're, well, they're already kind of setting, setting this precedent that we can't trust this. And that's exactly what they did when the DNC leak first came about. They immediately blamed it on Russia. So anyone that's getting their information from the mainstream media can just write it off, that cognitive dissonance that, oh, it was Russia. And, the, and now this is exactly what the Democrats are coming out, claiming that the next WikiLeaks release is going to include fabricated content. They're actually saying that Russia and their master hackers are getting in there and changing the metadata and they're they're changing the <laughs> content of the emails as they exist. So right. They're already prepping people for this huge psyop. Right, exactly, because they, they know that, uh, I, I don't know how you would go in, well, I guess it's possible, but you know, more importantly, they're shifting the blame to big bad Russia. They're the big bad wolf here and not the blaring headline <laughs> that the woman has hidden 15,000 additional emails. Um, now, the content of these emails, Leanne, very speculative, but at this point we know that her top aide, Huma Abedin, um, it, it reveals that she acted as a conduit between the Clinton Foundation, these donors, and Clinton serving as Secretary of State. In more than a dozen of these exchanges, she was providing expedited direct, direct access to Clinton for donors who'd contributed a certain amount of money. So big right. problems here because she was Secretary of, the, of State at the time. And, you know, she's got the, this foreign donor list, 1,100 foreign donors that actually remain a secret. Hopefully we're going to be finding out more 
if that's inside of these emails, who they are. But we know that 53% of her donors that gave a million or more, they were foreign citizens, corporations, or foreign governments, which is in direct violation of a foreign cash ban. You can't do that legally. Right. She was doing it as Secretary of State. Yeah, and let's not forget that she and her husband signed an agreement with uh, the Obama administration that they wouldn't have these type of nefarious dealings. They promised to, you know, steer no pay clear. to play here. No pay to play. There wouldn't be anything going on uh, while she was a secretary of state. Now, of course, they're coming out saying that again with the Clinton Foundation that they promise to not accept foreign donations if she becomes the president of the United States. But we've already heard <laughs> this, you know, so why was it OK when she right. was one of the top officials in the Obama administration. Right. What a relief that she's no longer going to be doing it um, because pay to play was okay as Secretary of State. But if, if you're president, you know, that's a different ballgame Yeah, game you're entirely. on a whole other level of accountability there, right. just as we've seen with, with President Obama. Now, let's, you know, let's not forget that, of course, Hillary Clinton also said uh, during, it's revealed that during her FBI briefing there, that she said Colin Powell was the one who told her to set up this private email server. And he's actually come out on Sunday saying, you know what, I'm free. And I'm just going to tell you guys that is absolutely not true. She's trying to pin this on me. Mm -hmm. The truth is she was using it for a year before I sent her a memo telling her what I did mm -hmm. during my tenure as Secretary of State. So she had already been setting this up. And then he revealed that he had this private email. Um, but the difference is, is that while he was Secretary of State, he was in constant communication with the State Department. The State Department actually set up his email for him, and he never used it to send classified information, mm -hmm. which is totally in opposite of what we see with Clinton. It's in the realm, so the legal murky gray water of what she was doing, sending classified information. If anybody else had been doing this, Leanne, they'd be in jail right now. Any low-level military, anybody doing this outside of her, she seems to be above the law right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we're, sh we're shining some light on this and getting some attention because the woman belongs in prison. This is a crime, right. what she was doing, setting up a private server in her bathroom to send classified information back right. and forth and then losing them you know, losing that, that cachet of emails or I didn't send them, yeah. it's lie after lie And, the, and lie. the Russians were somehow able to get a hold of the DNC emails, but not Hillary Clinton's that she had set up on her private email server that was inside of her home. She is the first secretary of state to exclusively use a private email account for official business. And also, too, something that she said, which turned out later to be a lie um, with those deleted emails that she turned over, her team didn't actually read the emails. They skimmed the subject lines instead. There was never anyone who was outside of Clinton's circle um, who was brought in to oversee this process. And as we've seen with some of these leaked emails, they might have started the, the email thread on a personal business, like with uh, her daughter's wedding or something. Mm -hmm. But then she would respond and say, hey, by the way, did we talk to so-and-so? Mm -hmm. And so it started to mix in with business um, with their, her private issues, and so she just deleted them, didn't even skim the contents of these emails, <laughs> like she told the American people she did. Right, so precisely right. The conflict of interest and the defender of corrupt and rigged status quo, that's what Donald Trump has said about her. She is the defender of the corrupt and rigged status quo. And the call to have this initiative shut down, it looks like it's been effective here. Going back to those emails and specifically talking about this aid, I've been looking at Huma, I don't know if you want to get into her at the moment. Should we should we just jump right into her? Because this this close aid, this 20 year uh, years of service that uh, Huma Abedin gave to Clinton, she became an intern right around the time of Monica Lewinsky. And we know from these emails that uh, Huma would call her confused, that she thought that sometimes that she had to repeat things over and over. And we know that she was a handler. And looking at who was controlling Huma, well, her ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudis running Huma, and then she's running Clinton, we have a serious problem going on right. here. It explains our foreign policy directives. And uh, right around the time of, of the Arab Spring, Obama was helping an usher in this Arab Spring. Um, obviously, Egypt fell to the Muslim Brotherhood. They have a history of persecuting and, and putting to death Coptic Christians, uh, but that's all in the name of democracy. Well, Huma, the, the personal connections that she has to the Muslim Brotherhood, we understand that she could be at the heart of a lot of these foreign policy directives. Do we really want that, you know, having the ear of the Secretary of State who may or may not be confused Right. You know, or may or may not have dementia or tired, <laughs> right? It's like being uh, controlled by her handler, Huma, who has access to her private emails because uh, a lot of the times. It's Huma who is responding right. as Hillary Clinton saying, hey, it's Huma, you know, let me know. 
what, and I will set it up for you, which is, a, you know, the, this is why we're seeing a leaked Army operational security brief. Um, there was actually a slide where they were showing Hillary Clinton as, a, an, as an example of a possible inside security threat. Mm. And, and it's pr just what you're saying with Huma and her connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. You just never know who has the ear of these people who are in power. Right, or their, their motivation to nudge and to influence the direction of the State Department, what direction it will take, you know, di directly influencing our immigration policy, uh, the aid that we give to places like Egypt, you know, being able, th this, this pay to play aspect of, of Huma's ties to Saudi Arabia. We know that she grew up in Saudi Arabia, that she lived there from the age of two, that her mother is a prominent professor in Saudi Arabia, that uh, this radical Muslim journal for 12 years, she listed herself as a co-editor. And then today the Clinton uh, campaign comes out and says, no, she had no direct part in this. When her mother is the editor in chief, they're writing all of, the, all of this radical ideology down. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. I had nothing to do with that. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. And well, and also too, I think they really came after her because Huma was painting her mother as this feminist who really mm -hmm. inspired her. Meanwhile, she's writing uh, you know, all about how women should cover themselves and right. really shouldn't try to move forward with women's liberation. And right. You're, it's, it, you're, it's okay that we call her a feminist, but in, in reality, you know, these articles that are coming out, single moms, working moms, gay couples with children, they're not actually recognized as families. <laughs> And uh, women's rights are Islamic rights. They're not uh, human rights, which you would think that they would just be plain old human rights. More example of people believing that Sharia law trumps the Constitution, which is why we really need to be concerned with you know, who has the ear of the president. This, exactly. She would be um, Clinton's secretary. Uh, she would be her chief of staff. And just to point out, you know, looking at looking at whom all day, I've been looking at this woman all day long. Her personal sham marriage, you know, riding her way to the top, one little problem, her husband didn't become mayor of New York City, and oh yeah, he has a severe issue with lewd and lascivious photographs, which he just cannot help <laughs> himself from Weider. sending. Well, that's going to do it for us for tonight. Be sure and tune in tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central. We're going to be bringing you live coverage of Donald Trump's visit to Austin, Texas.